want to invite you to open your Bibles to John chapter 20, John chapter 20, and we're going to be in verses 24 through 31 this morning as we wrap up chapter 20 together. That's John chapter 20, and we're going to be in verses 24 through 31. We pick up. Jesus has risen from the dead. And John writes for us in verse 24, Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful to be here um, hear your word, to sit under your word. Father, I'm praying that we would encounter the text today, that we would be strengthened all the more in our faith that Jesus is alive. Father, I'm praying that if there are any among us who have not believed that he has risen from the dead, Father, that they would know today that he is alive, that they would be convinced, Father, that they would be shown and called and humbled to know that Jesus, your son, truly did die on a cross and truly did rise from the dead. And so, Father, I pray that you would bless this time together. And, Father, I ask that it would be to the glory of Jesus, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. We've all heard that uh, famous old adage, seeing is believing, right? Right? Imagine you're on a beach somewhere and the sunset is painting us this beautiful sky for you and you're there by the waves and you're sitting there on the beach and you look out and you see this group of dolphins just pop up and you say, hey, there's dolphins and you know that they're real because you've seen them and even if you haven't seen them, you've seen pictures of them. Why do we believe that dolphins are real? Because we've seen them. And we want to take that principle often, and we want to apply it to the truths of God's word, and we think that we have to see to believe. And for us, what I'm going to teach you today from God's word is that that's not the truth, but rather it's the opposite for us that we must believe to see. But for Thomas, as we're going to see in the text, and the other disciples, It absolutely was the case that they needed to see to believe. As we wrap up chapter 20 this morning, we're reminded of the authority of the risen Christ, the risen Jesus. Last week, we've seen this very clearly as we saw Jesus present himself alive to the ten. And what were the ten doing? Well, they were hiding in a locked room. They were there because they were afraid of the Jews, the the leaders, because the body of Jesus was missing. We know why they were scared. The text told us they were scared because the body was gone. The Jews had made provisions to secure the tomb from any of his disciples coming to steal away the body of Jesus so that they wouldn't be able to fabricate some narrative that he had risen from the dead. The Jews knew this was Jesus' claim, that he would die 
And that he said that he would rise on the third day. And so what did they do? They said, we're going to make it, we're going to secure it as much as we need to and have it heavily guarded so that his disciples cannot come back and say that he was the Christ, that he was the Messiah, and that what he said was the truth. And lo and behold, the third day comes, and we saw last week that an angel of the Lord came and rolled away the stone, and the Roman guards who were there, they fell like dead men to the ground, and they were scared out of their minds. And next, we know that Jesus, he appeared to Mary Magdalene, and then to the ten. And the significance behind his bodily resurrection is that it confirms his identity. It confirms his authority. This is the point for the past, what, three weeks now that we're trying to make, that all of his claims were true, that he is indeed the Son of God. It proved that he had authority over the Jewish leaders who delivered him over to the Romans. And the disciples need now not to fear them. It proved that Jesus had authority over the Romans. Therefore, his disciples need not to fear them. And so, therefore, let me ask you this. What does this mean for us? For all of us, then, who are his. How does this empower you? How does it build up your faith? Let me ask you this. If, if not even death could hold him, And if he is the Son of God and the Father approves of him and all of his claims are true, what does this mean for us who are his? What does it mean for us who have put our faith in him? Here's what it means. It means that we ought to live bold and courageous lives even unto death for the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Listen, if he has all authority... If he has all authority in heaven and on earth, then, then, then who ought we to fear but God? Who ought we to live for but him? Who ought we to live boldly for but Jesus? And doesn't that, in, doesn't that strengthen your faith? Does that bolden your faith about Christ and give you the courage to live for him? Is this not the very picture that we get from Jesus in Revelation chapter 1 in verses 17 through 18 when John gets this incredible vision of our risen Lord? John writes this. He says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me saying, fear not. I am the first and the last and the living one. I died And behold, I am alive forevermore, and I, look at the authority, I have the keys of death and Hades. We know that's exactly what his disciples did. They lived boldly and courageously for Jesus once they believed. All of them would go on to give their lives for the gospel of Jesus. And we must say this. Because this is a fact, not because their Lord died a brutal death and was killed. You realize that. But because their Lord and their master, their teacher, and as we'll see in the text today, their God died a brutal death and was raised from the dead. Church, listen to me. When you have your faith in a risen Savior, there is no one else to fear but him. There's no one else to live for but him. The ten there in the locked room that day, they saw him and they were glad. They were glad to see the risen Lord, but one of them wasn't there and that was Thomas. Doubting Thomas as he is known. John writes for us in verses 24 through 25, Now Thomas, one of the twelve called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Brothers and sisters, what I want to share with you this morning is that as 
the eyewitness accounts of the disciples of Jesus' resurrection is powerful. It's only as powerful as it is because they were also eyewitnesses to his death. Thomas is saying, you guys are crazy. I saw him die. I saw it with my own eyes. I saw what they did to him. I saw how they nailed him to a Roman cross. I saw how bloodied his body was. I saw how he stopped breathing. I saw him pierced with a Roman spear. And beyond that, I saw them take his lifeless body off of that cross and they wrapped it up and they sealed it away. And they put it in a tomb. I saw it, Thomas is saying. Let's not miss what the scriptures are showing us here. Thomas said, how on earth can you now be saying to me that we have seen the Lord? I saw everything that took place. And unless I see, I don't care what you're telling me. Unless I see with my own eyes in his hands the mark of the nails and I place my fingers into the mark of the nails and I place my hand into his side, I will never believe. The power of the eyewitness accounts to his resurrection are only as powerful in that they saw Jesus Die this brutal and merciless death on a cross. You got to give Thomas some credit here. The other disciples, they didn't believe either. They didn't believe either until they saw him alive. Why else were they hiding in fear? Behind locked doors. They didn't believe the testimony of Mary Magdalene. We've seen the Lord. Mary, you're crazy. We saw him die. This is very important to our faith, and I'm going to tell you why. They had to see to believe. That is true for them. It's not true for us. It is true For the disciples, they had to see in order to believe. And until they saw him alive, why? Because they saw him die. To us, it's just a story right now. To them, they were there. They saw it all take place. And here's what I'm getting at. The proclamation of the gospel going forward was dependent upon them doubting that he was alive until they saw him risen from the dead. Otherwise, who would believe them? Who would believe their testimony? Now, Jesus had done all the labor. Sure. He'd done all the tilling up in their hearts. He had prepared them for this moment. For for the prior three years of his ministry, he had been telling them all along what exactly would take place, what exactly would, would happen. Matthew 17, 22 through 23, we see Jesus, he said to them, as they were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. And they were greatly distressed. Now, he did this numerous times. Numerous times he would prepare them in these ways. And each time we're told that they didn't understand. They were greatly distressed. They didn't know what it meant. They were confused. But only because, listen to this, because this is where it all hinges upon. Only because Jesus kept it from them from fully understanding until the right moment for them to believe. Luke gives us a little more detail to this account when Jesus appears to the ten in the locked room. We hadn't looked at this yet, but I want to look at it this morning. This is amazing. Look at it with me. Luke 24, 36 through 49. Luke writes, as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace to you. 
But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? Why do you doubt? Why do your doubts arise in your hearts? See? My hands and my feet, that it is myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved, look at that, for joy and were marveling, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it before them. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you. That everything written about me in the law of Moses and prophets and and, and Psalms must be fulfilled. Now watch this, church. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are my witnesses of these things and behold I'm sending you the promise of my father upon you but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high that would be Acts 2 they had to see his death so vividly in order to doubt his resurrection until they saw him physically that's what we just read and beyond that We see here, Now I know that I'm being tedious with this, but this is incredibly important to our faith and the building up of our faith and the reinforcing of our faith and why we believe all of this to be the truth. Because you see, Thomas doubted. The disciples doubted. That's important. It reveals to you and I, it authenticates not only their eyewitness accounts of his death, but it emboldens and it supports their proclamation that he truly and really is alive. If you can wrap your mind around this, listen, it's going to build up your faith because here's the thing. You and I, we don't get to see before we believe. We don't. And what I'm trying to tell you is that had it not been worked out this way, then why should we believe the disciples? It wasn't until he opened their minds that they believed. And because they go from fear of man to fear of Jesus... Because they go from doubting to believing, because they saw that he who was once dead is now alive, it serves as a remarkable testimony and evidence that supports their claims going forward. And it's brought out even more for us through Thomas in the text, who said, I will never believe. I will never believe unless I see for my own self. Look at verses 26 through 28 of our text. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again. Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not, look at this, do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Thomas goes from doubting to believing. He goes from fear of man and ignorance of what Jesus had prior taught him to full awe and worship of Jesus. You and I are taught something really pretty amazing here you know scars are a reminder of what our body has went through here on earth all of us have some sort of scars on our bodies we could point to them we can tell you the stories of all of them we can tell you what happened how old we were probably 
All of those things. We remember it, whether it's from scraping our knees as a kid or other events in our lives that took place. I've got several scars on my body as well. And they are reminders of something that happened to me at some time in my life. My right hand, I have a scar that reminds me of a time I did something very stupid. And trying to impress those around me in middle school, I punched a die cut. You know what a die cut is? It, it cuts out a letter. It's got a razor blade in it, but you can't see the razor blade. And I punched that because some girl said, hey, Ronnie, punch this. And so I did. And you know what happened? It severed my tendon. And I had to have surgery on my hand. I have the scar from that. On my left inner elbow, I have a, a, a scar that reminds me of a time when I was younger. Uh, I sat on a glass TV tree, I think it was, and it collapsed. And it broke the glass, and as I was falling to the ground, the glass cut my arm. And it reminds me that that took place in my life. I have a scar on my pinky here, who I think that we were celebrating Kylie's birthday, and I was preparing for that and slicing onions on a mandolin. And as my hand went down, the onion got, it started to disappear. And new meat came, right, in the picture. And my pinky hit the mandolin and it sliced it. I had to go get some stitches. These scars, they remind us of things. I have scars on my lungs. that Though I can't see them, I can feel them. And any time I exert too much energy for long periods of time, I'm reminded of my time in the hospital with COVID. Scars are reminders. They tell a story. They teach us something. And here's the great news. Listen to me. One day, this body of mine is going to decay. It's going to be no more. It will eventually, when I die, decompose, and all that will be left of it is dried up old bones. And because of Jesus, and because of his resurrection from the dead, the promise that I have in him is that one day I'm going to get a new body. The old has passed away, and the new has come. And you know what? Listen, there won't be a single scar on it. How I long for that day. And even though I don't like to run, it's going to be nice to be able to run again. When all this is wiped away and there is no more pain, right? When there's no more suffering, when there's no more sickness, when there's no more death, no more scars. Except but on one. Who? Jesus. You see, what we learn in this text from Doubting Thomas and the other disciples is that Jesus still has scars. You know why? Because for all eternity, you and I will be reminded of what it took. We will be reminded of his incredible love, that nothing is going to separate us from him ever again. We'll be reminded of his mercy We'll be reminded of his kindness. And we'll be reminded of his sacrifice for us. His body never decayed in the grave. But he rose again on the third day. Fully glorified. And yet intentionally left with the scars from the nails. And from his side. He says to Thomas, put your fingers here. Put out your hand and place it into my side and see, Thomas, that it is me. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And don't you know, church, that when you and I gaze upon him, that when we see our Lord, when we see those scars for ourselves, how precious that moment's going to be. You see, one day, you and I who believe we will see. We will see. Look at what Jesus says to Thomas in verse 29. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed. The word there is, how happy 
are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Church, listen to me. You and I walk by faith, not by sight. That's real for us. For us, we don't get to see to believe, but we get to believe to see. And one day you and I are going to have the opportunity to put our fingers there and to reach out and put our hands and touch the living Jesus. The Bible says right now for us in 1 Peter 1, 8 through 9, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him, and you rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. I'm moved by this. Because yes, there are many people I cannot wait to see when I die. And when I go to paradise, there are loved ones that I can't wait to see. There are Bible heroes that I cannot wait to see. But above all, and this is not just a spiritual answer, this is real for me. But above all, I cannot wait to see him. To see the scars. I want to look at them. I want to touch them. I want to see Jesus, but for now, you and I, we walk by faith. And John writes for us in verses 30 through 31, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Brothers and sisters, I've just got a confession that I've got to tell you. I have never seen Jesus. I don't know what he looks like. I have never seen him. Don't let anybody tell you that they have, because they have not. Only the eyewitnesses in the first century that were privileged enough to see him rise from the dead and see him physically alive, they are the only ones that have seen them with their eyes until they died. I've never seen him. Brothers, one day we'll see. But for now, we will believe by faith in our risen Lord. And briefly, I want to give you a few reasons to why I believe even though I have not seen him. First, we have the testimony of Scripture. Please don't write this off. This is so important and valuable to your faith Peter continues on to say in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verses 10 through 12, he says, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you, though those who, through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Jesus says elsewhere, speaking to his disciples, blessed are you for kings long to see what you see. What's he talking about? He's talking about times past. They didn't get to see the risen Christ. They didn't get to see the Messiah. But they prophesied. They proclaimed by faith that he would come. And he did. And he came. And there was a special group of people at the right time that got to see him, that got to walk with him, that got to be eyewitnesses. And what the scriptures are saying is what, what, what the Old Testament prophets did was they proclaimed this. And everything that has happened with Jesus from his birth, his life, to his ministry, to his death, and, all, and his resurrection was all foretold long, long ago before he came into the world. And you and I simply could not believe in him without the Old Testament scriptures affirming him to be the Christ. Second, second, not only do we have the ancient prophecies, 
but we have the eyewitness accounts of the apostles themselves. We know that they saw him. And not only did they see him die, but they saw him alive after he died. And not just them, but the scripture tells us from the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 5, 3 through 8, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And look at this, and that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, then to the 12, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive. Though some have fallen asleep, they've died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. You and I have Credible witnesses that affirm that Jesus is alive. That he truly did rise from the dead. And they have given their very lives unto death for him. What could be more powerful than that? And then last of all, you and I who have believed. Now let's talk about us. We have the very personal and convictional power of the Holy Spirit of God who has convicted us of our sin and indwelled us, convincing us that Jesus is alive. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 12 through 16, Paul writes this, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given to us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But look at this. We have the mind of Christ. Why? Because the Spirit of God dwells within us. He has taught us. He has convinced us. He has shown us in our hearts that Jesus is alive. And you look out at the lost world and they look at us like we're fools. Why? Because that has not been personally revealed to them as it has been to us by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now let me, let me tell you something. The most powerful and most convincing thing in your life currently that Jesus is alive is your personal encounter with the living God. Listen to me. Don't ever discredit your testimony. It is your most powerful tool in sharing the gospel with others. It is your most convincing evidence that he is alive. Yours, yours personally. And here's why. You who know him, you are personally convinced because you have a testimony of once being lost and now you're found. Dead men don't change lives. I like what Athanasius of Alexandria wrote long ago in the 4th century. He was a church father who before the age of 20 years old wrote a treatise called On the Incarnation of Christ. Before the age of 20. This is a teenager. Now think about this. He said concerning the living Christ, 
If this proof of his resurrection is not sufficient for anyone, let him believe what is said from what takes place before his eyes. If anyone is dead, he cannot act, for the gift lasts only until the grave and thereafter ceases. Deeds and actions towards other human beings only belong to the living. Let him who will see and judge, confessing the truth from the visible facts. He's saying, look at the facts. For since the Savior works so many things among human beings and daily in every place, visibly, invisibly, persuades such a great multitude, both from those who dwell in Greece and in foreign lands, to turn his faith and to obey his teaching, would anyone still have doubt in their mind whether the resurrection has been accomplished by the Savior and whether Christ is alive or rather is himself the life. Is it like a, a dead man to prick the minds of human beings so that they deny their father's laws and revere the teaching of Christ? Or how, if he's not acting, for this is a property of one dead, does he stop those active and alive so that the adulterer no longer commits adultery, the murderer no longer murders, the unjust no longer grasps greedily, and the impious is henceforth pious? How, how then, if he is not risen from the dead, does he stop and drive out and cast down those false gods said by unbelievers to be alive and the demons that they worship? For where Christ and his faith are named, there all idolatry is purged away. Every deceit of demons is refuted, and no demon endures the name, but fleeing, only hearing it disappears. This is not the work of one dead, but of one alive, and especially of God. For if it is true that the dead can affect nothing, but the Savior affects such great things every day. Drawing to piety, persuading to virtue, teaching about immortality, leading to a desire for heavenly things, revealing the knowledge of the Father, inspiring power against death, showing himself to each and purging away the godlessness of idols. Who then would one say is dead? The fact that Jesus has changed your life is proof that he's alive. You need no further evidence. You've seen him with your heart. Once you were doomed and you were headed for hell. And now you are saved and you're headed toward his kingdom. And your personal testimony is your most convincing evidence that he is alive because all that has been written and has taken place has been taken and has been applied to you in a very personal way by the Holy Spirit. And for that reason, those who are lost around you cannot understand what you understand. As Peter says in 1 Peter 2, 7 through 8, we're going to close. So the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Jesus. Jesus has made himself known to you. How precious is that? And you have believed upon him. And brothers and sisters, what a precious and gracious thing that he has done for you and for me to call us by name, to bring us close to himself so that one day, listen, one day you and I will not only see, but we will touch the scars that healed us. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful. We're thankful that Jesus is alive. Father, we believe. Though we have not seen him, we believe. 
and we love him. And I, for one, cannot wait till I gaze upon my Savior. I want to look at his scars. I want to, as Thomas did, reach out and touch him. I long for that day. I want it. I want Jesus. Father, I thank you for him. I owe him everything. And so do we all. So, Father, let us receive your word with gladness this morning. And let this embolden our faith to live boldly and courageously in this world. And in this life and in whatever context we're in. That we would not be ashamed of our Savior. That we would say along with the Apostle Paul that I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power for those who believe. Father, we love you in Jesus' name.